everyone. It's my great honor to be able to introduce today um, Rufus Reed, one of the most prominent bassists in jazz today and an amazing composer. Um, we're fortunate enough to have him in residence this week with the Harvard Jazz Bands, and I wanted to remind you that on Saturday night, there will be a concert of the Harvard Jazz Bands led by Yosvani Terry and featuring the work of Rufus Reed. Uh, he, he was born and raised, well, no, you weren't born there. You were born in Georgia, right? Okay. But he was raised in Sacramento, California, and he originally played the trumpet, grew up playing the trumpet, was a good enough trumpet player to uh, be part of the Air Force uh, band when he joined the Air Force. But so when he was in the Air Force, he became extremely interested in the bass, and from what I read, you used to sneak off and practice the bass, and that was m more fun than practicing the trumpet. <laughs> so he went on and he earned a, uh, uh, a Bachelor of Music in Double Bass Performance from Northwestern University in 1971. And um, he came to prominence on the New York scene when he joined Dexter Gordon's band uh, around 1976 when Dexter Gordon returned from Europe. From there, he ascended the world of uh, the New York jazz scene and played with you know, just everybody, Kenny Barron, Art Farmer, Joe Henderson, Eddie Harris, Nancy Wilson, Bobby Hutcherson, and J.J. Johnson, just to name a few. Now, if that wasn't enough, he also um, founded the successful jazz studies program at William Patterson University, which has been such an important um, school for the training of jazz musicians, and the alumni from this program are amazing. He taught there for 20 years and retired in 1999, and he wrote this, hurrah, yes, okay, yes, <laughs> a classic book called The Evolving Bassist, which is still a very, very important classic book of instruction for bassists. Now, the interesting thing I found is that when you retired, you joined this BMI Jazz Composers Workshop, and you were a part of that for about five years or so, right? That, that's correct. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, an explosion for me in terms of composing. I had no idea what to do. Well, he sure figured it out, okay, <laughs> that's all I can say. So. He writes this amazing music, and um, in 2006, he got the Sackler Composition Prize for Qu the Quiet Pride, the Elizabeth Catlett Project, and you received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2008 for an orchestral piece called Mass Transit. Um, and on the concert on Saturday night, two movements from the Elizabeth Catlett uh, Project are going to be played. And she seems like this incredibly interesting person, an African-American artist and activist. She went to Howard University. She became the chair of the art department at Dillard University. And you know, she spent a, then she emigrated to Mexico for many years um, and was involved in the circus, uh, circle of artists around Diego Rivera. Um, there are many more things, but I hope we'll, we'll get into conversation about them, Mr. Reed's Beautiful woody tones, swinging lines, artistic solos, and total command of the instrument make his sound instantly recognizable. So please join me in welcoming Rufus Reed. Thank you. Wow. We have good crowds here. <laughs> But I was hoping we could start, I am so fascinated by this Elizabeth Catlett project that you worked on. Um, and the movements are based on works of art by her. She's this amazing sculptor. They're, the five movements are five of her sculptures, of her probably over 150 sculptures and etchings and paintings. She wasn't just a sculptor, she actually did uh, Lionel Cut and um, mm -hmm. um, uh, just uh, etchings with and charcoal, and she did a lot of different things. And uh, the best part about the story is that I finally got a chance to meet her, and mm -hmm. 
she reminded me a great deal of my grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, amazing. Uh, she actually comes, uh, she has three sons. One's a drummer, uh, who, a, per a percussionist who lives in New York City, mm -hmm. and a filmmaker who's very well known in Mexico City, all over. And another, the youngest son is a sculptor who lives in Germany. And so, uh, and then she married Francisco Mora, who's a very prominent um, artist in Mexico. And, but she's just, she alone, that was a story uh, because of when she came up and she was very outspoken during the MacArthur period in New York in the 50s. And uh, she, uh, never minced her words, and so consequently she got herself in trouble a lot by just saying no, or people accused her of, of being a communist and all these kinds of things, and uh, uh, all she wanted to be people to be fair to her, you know, and, uh, but they did, when she was in school, she was recognized as being a, an exceptional artist. Uh, she was, uh, amazing in that she, they wanted her to go to Carnegie Mellon, but of course, when they found out that she was black, they couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't go. And um, eventually, it, I guess within the last 10 years, that had been rectified uh, by the president, and uh, so the family felt uh, a, a little bit better about it, but the damage had already been done. But because of her being so outspoken, uh, they, I guess there was an instance, I'm not sure about what it was, but they said, perhaps you should go to Mexico till everything cools off a little bit. And then that's when she went down there. And, and then she, she was not uh, denounced from the USA, but she couldn't come back into the country for uh, several years. In fact, during the time I knew her, it was maybe about three, four years that she was given her passport about, uh, that she could actually come back to the to the United States and freely, uh, and I guess she was being awarded by uh, uh, some art organization in Washington D.C. and they lobbied to get her to, and she was able to get a pass, so to speak, to come in to accept it. And when she and I asked her, I said, "Well, how did it feel to get your?" passport back. She says, well, it was great, but I know why, because now I'm supposed to be an important artist. I have to pay my taxes, you know. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, okay. that's how she was, you know. Right, exactly. I mean, she was so blunt, and I, the first time we met, I said, I'd uh, love you to come out to the house. I'll cook, cook for you, and she says, can you cook? <laughs> you know, I mean, so it was right to the point, you know, she, yes. she really didn't mince words, but she was uh, an incredibly uh, down to earth. She could be right here and you would know, would not know that she was anybody important or anything, you know, because she was really uh, fascinating and she wanted, she wanted people to enjoy her art without having to pay to see it mm -hmm. or anything like that. And, and, uh, but she she gave me a thrill because I, she said she had never had anybody write anything this ambitiously about any of her art before. So that was quite thrilling. Can you yeah. say something about how you selected the sculptures that you wanted to include? Well, that's an interesting story. I, um, I used to be involved with an organization called Arts Recognition and Talent Search. This mm -hmm. was long before the National Foundation for the Arts. I was on a panel, and we would always go to ETS, which was where they made the testing uh, in, in Princeton, New Jersey. So I went down there to do one of those panels, and uh, there was a lady there, and she was finishing up her time being there, and she was talking to everyone, and we were finished, and she had these books. And it was a book about Elizabeth Cather, who I had no idea who she was. And it was a big coffee table book. You know, they're heavy and um, really nice. And I don't think she wanted to take them home, so she sold them really cheap, you know. <laughs> and so I bought one, and it, lo it looked really nice, and so I brought it home. 
And 20 years later, it was, had all this dust on it, you know, like coffee table books collect dust, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so consequently, when I, the Sackler Commission, um, it was the first time that they actually uh, wanted jazz. It, every year, the Sacklers Commission, uh, but primarily classical music, e either string quartet, piano trios, arias, um, wind ensemble, etc. But the year it came across my desk because of the BMI Composers Workshop, I was on the mailing list, and it was for twenty thousand dollars, and I had no reason to not. I mean, I didn't think I'd get it anyway. So I did apply, but you had to propose something. Uh, two of my really close friends, Jim McNeely, who was a wonderful composer, and he had just gotten a commission to write music for Paul Clay Center that was being mm -hmm. opened up in Switzerland. And so he took 10 of his uh, uh, paintings and wrote music to it. There was another woman by the name of Jane Ira Bloom, who was a fantastic mm -hmm saxophonist, and I recorded a couple things and played many years with her, and she, we would do music inspired by Miro or uh, Jackson Pollock or something like that, and so all these things, this workshop was making us get, about, get out of our comfort zone, and, and then these people would kind of inspired me, and then I said, well, I have this book at home, and get off the dust, and then I started opening it up because I had to propose something for this commission. They just didn't want me to write a, a big band chart, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then I started looking through the book and these images were all pretty fantastic, but these four, glory, recognition, and um, mother and child and the singing head, they just kind of jumped off the page. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, there it is. I'll propose to write music inspired by her work. And here again, I didn't think I was going to get it. Uh, in fact, I knew I wasn't going to get it, but I had nothing to lose, so I put it in. And uh, I, they gave me a call, and I had one. I had one, and it was uh, really kind of mind-blowing. And when the gentleman told me that I did win, he says, uh, you know, um, Raymond Sackler, he's a, he was a well-known medical doctor and a philanthropist, and so he gave money to the arts and also to the medical uh, for anything medical uh, research, and and they didn't know about Elizabeth Catlett at all. And there's a Sackler wing in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, <laughs> which I didn't know. Um, and and so in a way, it was intriguing to them. I won't say embarrassing to them because not everybody who loves jazz knows all jazz musicians or all the music. But they, uh, it resonated with them that they should have known about her, perhaps. And uh, because there's one of her uh, sculptures is at the, the museum. And she's the, is it the, Metropolitan. the Metropolitan. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And uh, so. Can you talk a little bit about, like, a, you know, we actually, um, have at the Hutchins Center now. There's the Cooper Gallery, and there's a there's an art display that is about that Suzanne Blier and David Bender have put together, sort of looking at the interrelationship between jazz and visual arts. Mm -hmm. So that's made me very interested in terms of translating the feeling that you got from each of these pieces. How did you go about sort of thinking about what the right musical language for that would be? Well, that was very interesting because a lot of that's one of the intangibles of composition. You know, you 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 really don't wait for the divine lightning bolt to hit you. You have to have some kind of idea. But I like the the sculpture of mother and child, which is mahogany, and it's just 
flawless. It's smooth. It's got really just flowing, mm -hmm. um, beautiful lines. Uh, and so to me, that depicts a, a, a beautiful melody that's linear, that's not jagged, it's not vertical. It's, it's just, uh, it has uh, a beautiful arc to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I attempted, whereas the structure, uh, the sculpture uh, Glory, which is of a woman's head, is, is very angst, uh, very powerful, uh, almost angry, but not really, but, um, um, and so to me that depicts maybe um, not the regular 251 or the, the, uh, the cadences that we all have become close to, to know, more angular and more vertical, um, obtuse kind of melodies mm -hmm. maybe uh, to, to get that happening. Uh, like one of the sculptures, is, it's called Stargazer. It's a, a woman figure which is black uh, marble, which is absolutely beautiful. It's about this large, it's huge, mm -hmm. looking up into the sky. And I called it Tapestry in the Sky. And it's uh, um, where you look at the stars and you, if you look long enough and you have time to you just start daydreaming. Well, with these images in mind, could we maybe listen to a little bit of each of these pieces um, to, to give you a feeling for what a rich uh, composition this is? Now, we just have to get to the right thing. So this is Mother and Child. of tapestry in the sky, which you just talked about. The first time the musicians read, the, read this one, they were saying, what the hell is he doing? <laughs>
colors and the richness of that, and the the sound is so transparent. Can you talk a little bit about like what some of the challenges are about um, getting this particular instrumentation to sound like how you'd like it to? I'm still working on that. <laughs> I, 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 to be quite honest, I mean, I I love the woodwinds, mm -hmm. and I I have the it's probably still one of my most uh, challenges to uh, because of the sonorities, the low sonorities of bass clarinet and mm -hmm. f flute and. Um, but I, I, uh, I don't know how to really answer that, uh, to be quite honest. Um, I've been playing long enough and been in many different kinds of situations mm -hmm. that I don't know where it's all coming from. I, I, and you may think that's not really true, but it truly is because I've never studied uh, academically uh, how to compose. However, I've spent many hours and uh, recorded many things with friends of mine that the music was, I said, wow, how did they do that? And the, the many different colors and the, the way that they uh, just organized. There has to be a contrast, there has to be uh, learning how to, if you're going to have density, you, it's got to breathe eventually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we'll, we'll just shut down. Uh, it's just like being in the military when the sergeant is this close to you and he's yelling at the top of his lungs, you don't even hear him anymore, you just shut down. So that's what happens with music. Uh, I think music is nothing but drama. And, and, and dynamic. So if you don't have that, um, there are books written on about, you know, when things should happen and with, uh, maybe that's true. Um, but uh, so I, I try to write something and then I get on the other side and try to listen to it. And when do I think there should be more mm -hmm. or less or many times, oh, I have to cut that out. I really have. And invariably, the, the most challenge for me is um, oh, they won't like that. <laughs> or uh, that's not really, oh, that's not really good. And then invariably, when I decide to, you know, because there's an executive decision one has mm -hmm. to make, and then when I decide to leave it in, that's the thing that most people like the most. Well, that's good. And which I began to say, wow, really? Okay. So, but it really is, is I try to think about um, uh, when I was doing the workshop, um, um, there was a gentleman named Manny Album and Jim McNeady uh, and Michael Abeni that were the, the coaches. And they said, well, you know, one of the things when you look at a score and you turn five pages and you don't see any daylight at all, they just turn it back in. They, they, <laughs> they, they don't even want to look at the rest of it. And then I said, well, what do you mean? He, he said, well, look, there's, no, there's, there's too much going on, and it's going on for too long. And so you have to really understand, um, and because composers can be very self-indulgent, you know, uh, because they feel they can do anything they want to do. Um, and which they can. However, if I would like, as a, as a player, as a performer, I would like the people, maybe I don't expect everyone to like everything that I play, but I'm sure if you listen long enough, you might want to hear it again, something. And I think that's what I want with the music. I want people to listen to it again. Well, I was wondering if you felt like, like having the ears of a bassist um, gave you some particular insight into writing for the larger band because I think about all those low notes and hearing harmony from the bassist's point of view. I've, um, is there another way? <laughs> is there another way? <laughs> I remember when I was playing trumpet a lot, I, I had a bassist who said to me, 
horn players can't hear low notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, when really... you think of all the uh, composers that at least have been very inspirational to me, mm -hmm. like J.J. Johnson, the trombones are in the middle of the band. Yes. Uh, Slide Hampton, uh, who wrote all these arrangements for Dexter Gordon. Um, Benny Golson, he's playing tenor saxophone, but it's not an alto, and it's, it's, uh, he's kind of in the middle there. Um, and I think that may have a somewhat part of it, um, because I, like I say, I am on the ground floor of, of things, and so uh, you can have something without the bass, and, and then when you bring the bass in, all of a sudden it changes, it, it, it blooms. Mm -hmm. And so um, learning when and when not to is, is really um, the, the challenge, you know. Well, with that insight in mind, I wonder if we could go way back and listen to um, some of your playing, like back with Dexter Gordon. Sure. You know, I, I, there's a recording of Red Top, mm -hmm. and it's got both. You sound really great sort of accompanying him at the beginning. Let's see if I can get this up here, of course. And then you take this amazing solo. At I, I later do. on, do you oh. remember this? You probably don't. Well, I do. <laughs> well, I'll I probably remember right it when I hear it. But uh, well, let's listen to a little bit of the opening, and then I'll move it ahead to the bass solo because it's so beautiful. This isn't red top. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Okay. That you took a, it's a blues, but he takes a, um, a, a not fully expected harmonic path through there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's it. That was a thrilling. That that session has a lot of layers on it. Uh, it was very exciting to uh, be a part of that, and that's when. I was chosen, uh, and Victor Lewis, uh, the drummer, to be part of the quartet. Victor was playing with Woody Shaw. Eventually, he uh, mm -hmm. wasn't playing with us. But to go into that session, uh, and Slide Hampton had written all these because he had just signed mm -hmm. the contract to do mm -hmm. this, this, to do the, to do these recordings, and. Uh, Slide had written these bass solos, and I saw the music, and I said, wow, I better... Because, okay, now I've arrived in New York. I've, I've been in New York a couple of years already, and 
but this was really special and um, I, I can I can see that day right now it was, <laughs> it was that vivid uh, I don't remember what I played except now I do um, but I just remember that was a very special time because Bobby Hutchison was there uh, he was probably the instrumental person to finally get me to move to New York. I wanted to move to New York, but neither were, were we financially ready to move um, and uh, whatnot. But uh, I, <clears throat> just to quickly tell you about it, because I thought it was really significant, Bobby Hutchison took, and Harold Land took me to Europe for the very first time. Mm -hmm. My wife and I went. The very first time, it was right after graduating from Northwestern. It was a great gift. Um, and we had five weeks going to see these big festivals. We were on the same festivals with Ella Fitzgerald and Oscar Peterson and all this in Italy, and it was unbelievable. So, in Chicago, this I was living in mm -hmm. Chicago at that time, and there was there were about five years that was work, 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 work. And then it got really lean. Mm -hmm. And I was working locally. And then Bobby Hutcherson would come back. And there were about two years, nothing was happening. And so I kind of, you know, became quote unquote local attitude. And so he comes back. I'm really excited because uh, I remember going to Europe and all these wonderful things. And it was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, matinee and Sunday night. I was really out of shape. And so Friday night, I knew it, but Friday night, I kind of got through the, through the, I kind of, it was okay. But I was really not happy. The next night I said, oh man, we got a little bit better. Sunday in the matinee, things start to, to tell. And of course, Sunday night, and then we're done. So at the end, he comes up to me and he's gonna pay me. And he looks me dead in the eyes and says, what's wrong with you? Your stuff is down. And I said, holy crap, he found out. I mean, you know, I couldn't hide it. And I was almost in tears. I went home and I told my wife, we're out of here. <laughs> you know, and um, so we're talking about maybe three years now. By the time this record mm -hmm. happens, I hadn't seen Bobby Hutchison since then. And so we took him into mission. <clears throat> we're in the studio, and, <clears throat> and one of the cords on the vibraphone broke, so he was kind of fixing it, and everybody was gone. And I'm looking at my bass parts because um, I didn't want them to stop because I was having difficulty. So he's way on the other side of the room because everything is kind of spread out. And so, and we hadn't had an opportunity to really speak. And so he's fixing his stuff and he looks up at me and he says, your stuff's not down now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and. And I love him to this day because he took the time to say something to me. Um, because, you know, most people don't say anything to you if they don't really care. And so he really cared. Uh, and I love him to this day just for that. Um, so that has a whole lot to do with that oh, album. Well, know? it's a, it's an amazing album. Um, and you went out on the road with Dexter, right? For over four years. And what uh, eight was that months like? out, Eight months out of the year. Some days would be three planes a day, you know, particularly in Europe. Uh, uh, I mean, it was constant. It, the office that we worked out of, it was Johnny Griffin's band mm -hmm. and Woody Shaw's band and Dexter's band. And all worked out of the same office and the, f the phone never stopped ringing. And so we were quite busy and uh, um, very fruitful. Uh, for, for the chemistry of that band was mm -hmm. was uh, pretty special, uh, and I've, as you know, I've been playing with a lot of people, but uh, over the years, and I can count on 
one hand the the, the chemistry that I, that I've had with with few people, and that was one of them for sure. And that it sounds like it's like the equivalent in jazz education, like getting a triple PhD. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you really get a lot of knowledge, um, uh, and and the the challenge or the pressure of when you go to a place, people come because they, okay, show me, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we, you find out, and, or they're excited just to even be in the room. Mm -hmm. It's just like me going to see Miles for the first time, Miles Davis, it was, yeah. it was like electric. Exactly. It was, you know, it was, it was fantastic. But playing with Dexter and George Cables and Eddie Gladden, um, I haven't actually played with a drummer like Eddie Gladden since. Mm -hmm. That actually was that thrilling to play with. George Cables and I had a chemistry, um, and I can count on one hand, uh, maybe two, three pianists that I have that kind of relationship with. That's very special. Yeah. Well, I know you also recorded with Kenny Barron. Yes. There is this album called New York Attitude. Um, and I wondered if we could play a tune from that because we you are it. swinging your you-know-what off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was hard not <laughs> Kenny makes it so, I mean, he doesn't look like uh, it's, nothing's happening. I mean, he's, his body doesn't move. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. very composed and focused like, I mean, and Victor Lewis is a very poetic drummer, you know, um, and, and we, we play very well together. Uh, haven't played with him, I played with him a little bit last year, a little bit, but, mm -hmm. During this period, uh, I don't even remember the date of that, it's but like it was 1984. Yeah, yeah that's a while back, yeah. Um, but we played a lot together, mm -hmm. and it seemed like it was effortless to play with him. So, especially a tempo like this, uh, it, it was. It, it, and I was playing a lot, so. Consequently, your quote unquote, your chops are up. Your chops are you up. Know, and Which... uh, you can't do this like turning on a water faucet. It, you just can't do it. And that's one of the things that I want to impress upon the students here. Uh, they all, in their mind, want to be able to do that. But the only reason I could do that or, is because we were doing it every day, um, literally every day and playing six nights a week, um, and which is not done hardly at, at all anymore, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, but, if, but that was one of the reasons why it sounded uh, effortless uh, that way because, and 
a lot of the people don't even want to play that fast anymore because they can't. It's not that they couldn't, but you don't just turn it on and off because it hurts <laughs> if, <laughs> if you try. You can hurt yourself. Uh, you really do have to learn how to breathe, how to relax because, uh, and you listen to people go back, go back further to Max Roach and Clifford Brown, I mean, they were playing fast every day. I mean, that was the first tune out of the box, you know, and you can't do that if you're not doing it, you know, period. Um, I wondered, um, you know, as an educator at William Patterson, how you would get your students on a pathway to achieving something close. Well, one of the... Um, my coordinator and partner in that was Dr. Martin Criven. Mm -hmm. he, he said he wanted to have a conduit directly to the marketplace so that there, there was a direct link to the real world. Not, not, mm -hmm. And so consequently I was able to bring in uh, adjunct faculty who were, wanted to share the what they did, but they were actually in the trenches. They were practitioners. They were doing it. They were not just kind of halfway doing it. And so the students actually could hear the difference. You can see the difference, but you can really hear the difference. And, um, and to get rid of the attitudes just because you, because, you know, one of the difficult things about teaching quote unquote music is to give a grade. <laughs> You know, uh, um, uh, you get an A because you passed the test. Uh, uh, you know, um, and so half of it is just being there. And, but we, we would challenge them to actually uh, have a repertoire. And then I instig instigated a, uh, or instituted a uh, jury, so to speak, but they would play with the faculty, which uh, most, most schools that have, you have a jury, but you play for the stone wall of people listening to you, and then you <laughs> just, and, and then you do whatever you say you were gonna do, and then you go out and you're petrified, and you, uh, but to me that's not real. The real world is to actually play with people. That's how I learned how to play. Mm -hmm. So, um, that apprenticeship. So I wanted, at least in this academic arena, to have something that was a little more tangible in, in the real world. Well, and you I know. think that was always the reputation of the William Patterson Absolutely. program, is you had working musicians, seriously professional musicians on the faculty. And, um, you, and then later, I think Rutgers started ha having some of that too, but I think that's really one of the things that made that program well, um, it, a very and special still, program, and, and it still and, is. And still, uh, but uh, it was very interesting because William Patterson was one of seven New Jersey schools, and of course, Rutgers being the Big Ten, mm -hmm. that's the important school. And of course, William Patterson was just a little, little bitty school, and, uh, but uh, that's, I took Dad Jones's place there. He was like an artist in residence, but mm -hmm. the program hadn't really developed mm -hmm. at, at that time. And then when he... Uh, left to go to Europe, I was asked to come in and because I would go out there and when I, I actually played two years with that Jones and Mel Lewis big mm -hmm. band and that was, mm -hmm. that was a fantastic period as well. But well, that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to do in that, that school. I mean, that's, that, was, you that, did was, it. that was what had to happen. Well, I wonder if we could play one more example of yours. Um, you, pl you recorded this album in 1991 with Joe Henderson called The Standard Joe. Mm -hmm. And the version of Inner Urge on that is pretty, pretty amazing. And then I thought we could listen to some of that and then open up to audience questions for Mr. Reed. my playlist had worked, this would be faster. 
solos on this album. He always did. It's great. <laughs> but I love him. I miss him uh, a great deal. And we miss him in the community with that voice that he had uh, mm -hmm. on the saxophone. It's very, very special. Uh, very soft-spoken man of few words, but usually very pointed. Actually, he, he talked more on the phone to me than it, when we were together, you know, it's kind of But funny. you seem to have such a well, he, dialogue with well, the bass with him. Well, he was very, um, and that was really special for me because there's no piano. And so I have this open field yes. to, to, to create. And as long as I was, he was assured that I was with him, um, or, you know, when we were to converge or in the phrases and whatnot, if, um, um, then it was fine. Because, but he was a truly creative, and he brought that out of you. Mm -hmm. It was very easy to play with him because uh, he was just, it just flowed. And w when we would play live, um, he would, he didn't have a huge sound like uh, Dexter, for instance. Mm -hmm. They were totally different in terms of sound production. But a very that, but when you hear everything in recording, the microphone, and he didn't move. You know, some people do this and do all <laughs> kinds. He didn't really move, and he was really close. But his sound, the, the studios, the microphones loved the sound because it was so focused. And... Um, um, and he was all over the horn. And, but when he started to really open up, Al Foster, who's the drummer mm -hmm. on this, who had been playing with him a lot more than I had at that time, he seemed to know when it was time, because he started out on brushes, and then when he would go to the sticks, and Joe's sound would just kind of puff up, and then, would, and then all of a sudden he would open up, and then this other sound on the saxophone would just and so you have to be ready to support all that when it happens. And so it was, it was always a thrill and a challenge. Um, I was really thrilled that he asked me to record this. This was before the major label picked him up. And mm -hmm. um, um, we actually do Body and Soul two, two yes. times on it, which, yes. which I was surprised that they did that. But it's really different. I mean. Uh, it was really special. But uh, I feel very fortunate. My whole career, I've been very playing with a lot of saxophone players, mm -hmm. but really significant ones. You know, uh, Eddie Harris being a huge mm -hmm. one, and then with Dexter, Stan Getz, uh, Benny Golson, and mm -hmm. Joe Henderson, you know. Pretty impressive list. So, would anybody who, uh, like to ask a question? Um, so what advice would you give to someone considering a career in music? <laughs> Good question. Um, a career in music that you already have a confidence about what it is you do, 
because that has nothing to do with sustaining a career in music. You have to have it, but it has nothing to do with it. You really have to learn about if this is, you're going to put the shingle out that this is what you do, which means that it's a business. And then you have to make people understand that you're serious and that you are uh, consistently on time. You consistently do what you say you can do and you, um, and you don't, your integrity is really huge. It, uh, you wouldn't think so, but there are a lot of people young because they need money and whatnot. They'll take a job and tell somebody I'll be there and then someone calls them for $25 more and then they go. So then you've blown your, 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 your integrity with the person that you've worked with who really loves the way you play and is depending on you. And if you do that enough, you're done, um, in my opinion. How one does it, I'm not sure, but every arena that you play in, it makes whoever comes to take your place, because you can be replaced, but they have difficulty doing that. So that means you have to, if you, if you what, what instrument do you play? Sax. So you can play clarinet and flute and, and uh, well, that's a commodity. And actually, if you play clarinet well, you'll play saxophone even better, uh, in my opinion, of all the people that I know. So um, nowadays, in the 21st century, uh, saxophone players don't even want to double because it's a lot of stuff to carry around, you know. But see, I had the electric bass and I had the double bass, and people said, Aren't you tired of carrying this? I said, you're not carrying it. Why are you talking to me about this? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, if you really want to make a mark and your reading skills are up and you actually, how we, we accrue, I, I, it's a really difficult question to really give you a, a, a solid answer. However, uh, if you really want it, you can have it. If you want it. There's a price for everything. You know, it depends on, you know, if you really want to be very famous and make a ton of money, and that's right up front, I suggest you not be a musician. <laughs> if you can do something else, you should do it. I can do other things. I, I told some people this, I'm not gonna go hungry. I know how to cook, I mean, not just simple things. Uh, and if I really had to, I could learn how to be a chef. I, I, I like that kind of stuff. Or, uh, so you do, you, 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 you do other things, but if you really want to play, um, then you have to find out who are the real players and you want to say, well, I want to be over there. Well, then that's where you put your target. And you don't go to New York to accept or to a place like New York to spread your wings. You don't go there to kind of get it together. If you don't have it together by the time you get to New York, you're going to get wiped out. <laughs> That's a foregone conclusion. So as far as I'm concerned, if you really want it, you can have it. It's there for you because most people don't want to pay the price to do it, you know. I believe that, uh, and if you really play well, you should know that. And yet you haven't been given the opportunity to be heard, so then you go out and, and where do you want to be seen? Who do you want to be seen with? Not your buddies, because they don't work as hard as you. And that's the hard part, because you want to hang out with your buddies but they don't work as hard as you. So eventually you're gonna to have to sever your buddies if you really want it. It's a, hard, it's a hard one, you know. But those are the real decisions. I've been very fortunate to, this, uh, this is all I ever wanted to do was to play. And then now that I'm able to do it, I had to protect it by, 
learning and doing it and, and, and trying to learn more and, and, and uh, get better at it. Um, it's not simple. Um, it really isn't. Um, sometimes I also wonder, um, I started teaching at William Patterson, but I didn't go to school to teach. But I taught, and people just talked about it. And eventually, I began. And uh, so you can have teachers who are teachers, but but they're not real teachers. You know, I, I didn't want to be a teacher because I didn't want to be like some of the teachers I had. <laughs> so you have to be really careful about how you how people perceive you. You know, say, wow. You know, you get people to talk about you after you've gone home in a good way. That's how your phone rings, you know. There's a question in the back. Kevin. Thanks so much, Mr. Reed, for uh, all your wisdom and for coming here. Um, I want to see if maybe you could say a few more words about what it's what it was like playing in the bands of different great saxophonists, being the bassist in Stan Getz's band versus Dexter Gordon's band versus Eddie Harris's band versus Benny Gold's. Ooh. Not really any really difference uh, to me, uh, the difference of playing. They all were very distinctly, uh, had personalities that were, Eddie Harris was my first boss. Um, I listened to music uh, on his recordings uh, when I was in the military and, and I may have gotten the record because Ron Carter was on the record, who was the bassist and that's, and then I began to learn more about Cedar Walton and who uh, those people were, et cetera. Uh, but Stan, like with Dexter Gordon, Dexter played on the low sonority of his horn, whereas Stan Getz played on the <coughs> upper uh, sonorities of the saxophone. And Eddie Harris was kind of in the middle of that. But Eddie could go up like couple of octaves above everybody else. Um, and Joe Henderson, uh, he just kind of spoke differently than all of them. Um, Dexter was this humongous sound. He put a lot of air in the horn. And he demanded, uh, I mean, he had this huge, robust sound. And he demanded a huge, robust sound around him. Um, and Stan Getz really was, uh, uh, had this golden sound. So I actually had to learn how to have a, at least appear to have a golden sound. I mean, he had a beautiful sound. So every note that I played had to be in tune and really uh, had a nice roundness to it. Um, um, same thing with Benny Golson, this lush sound. Um, and these are things that I think uh, no one said I had to do that, but it made sense for me to try to get this, this, this sound to just flow. Um, but in terms of what I did, uh, like playing with Joe, I probably could not play as freely in fact, I know I couldn't play as freely with Stan Getz like I did with Joe Henderson because he doesn't play that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, a presenter came up to me one time and says, you know, I really love the way you play with Tommy Flanagan. He's one of my most favorite pianists in the world. But you play with Jack D. Jeanette, his face started to crumble, and he says, you play with Jack D. Jeanette, I can't stand the way this guy plays. How can you play with Jack D. Jeanette? And I said, I don't understand the question. I said, uh, when I play with Jack, I play with Jack. And when I play with Tommy, I play with Tommy. I don't bring whatever I think I'm going to play you know, it's like if we're sitting here and talking, you're speaking English, and I just keep speaking German or Japanese to you or not <laughs> acknowledging you at all. Well, then why are we 
Why are we here? Why are we here? So um, uh, I, I great effort to actually uh, play with the people, literally play with the people that I play with, and leaving my um, personal things uh, because uh, here's here's the here's the trick. It's almost the same. I had the great fortune of playing with Jimmy Rolls, great pianist, and Tommy Flanagan, and Hank Jones, uh, and etc. And then I had an opportunity to play with Andrew Hill. And now Tommy Flanagan's over here, Andrew Hill is way <laughs> over there. <laughs> and so it took me a long time because none of my Ray Brown things, or my Paul Chambersisms, or my Ron Carter stuff, when I played with Andrew, none of it worked. None, it, it did not work. <laughs> and I could feel it's not working. What's not working? And then, then I just kind of slapped myself. I said, why don't you just play with him? Just play. And all of a sudden, this whole thing just opened up. And then some of my friends, in fact, Jane Ira Bloom, who kind of was open-ended, she happened to be at Rufus. You were having so much. I'd never heard you play like that before. It was fantastic. And I said, and so I, you have to learn to play in the musical setting you happen to be in. That's also one of the things you have to, if you can actually show some diversity and not put your th bebop thing on something that's not bebop, people say, oh, wow then they, they see you have actually a, 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 a larger palette. And I think that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why I've been able to uh, sustain myself, uh, because I haven't uh, closed any door in terms of what I would try to be. You know, um, at one time, I, I'm, I'm sure, when I was younger, oh, I don't like that. Ooh. You know, but that was primarily because I didn't know much about it. I didn't like Charlie Mingus at all at first. You know, the first time I heard him, I heard, so heard, I heard some things that I said, wow, that's really great. And then he played some funny notes and he would pull the strings and, you know, and I said, why did he do that? And then eventually, I, as I grew and learned a little more, then I heard his compositions and I realized that he could play the piano. I can't play piano, but, and then I heard some of his music that he wrote, and I said, oh, well, this guy's pretty heavy. <laughs> you know, so, but I had to grow into it, to accept it that it's, it's just not the way that I would have thought, but I can't say. And actually, now I can say, uh, okay, that's the way he felt that day, and that sometimes I feel that way. You get in touch with the way you actually feel, you know, and that's that to me is really what's really special about this music because it will allow you to be you. And most people don't are afraid to let that happen. Literally afraid. We can have one more question. You're here in academia around a lot of young people. Um, who are the young musicians that you are hearing nowadays? Any, any folks stand out? Uh, yes, and I try to listen uh, and even buy some of the CDs of some of the young people, but there's so many now, I, can't, I, don't, I don't even know some of their names, uh, but... Um, uh, there's some really uh, uh, young players that are coming up that are playing really solid um, that I, I believe they, they are really studied and they, they are really grounding themselves with the history. Uh, um, 
uh, there's a bass, young bass player by the name of Luquez, uh, what's his last name? Curtis, Curtis yeah. Mm -hmm. He's, I haven't met him yet. I just heard it on the recording, and I could tell that he had a really great left hand <laughs> because of the clarity of the notes that he plays. And then I met another woman uh, uh, who he plays with sometimes, and she, she says it's great, and he reads really well, and he uses the bow really well. There's another bassist by the name of Joe Saunders, who's uh, really uh, Gerald Clayton, John Clayton's son, is, is really pretty exceptional. Um, but they're, they're even younger than they are now, you know. Um, but I'm very, very happy to say the music is in good hands, truly. Um, the music hasn't been dead ever, but it, uh, because if we listen to the media, everything is dead, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, the music is very well, there's a, there's a trumpet player that, young Freddie Hendrix. Uh, there's a wonderful trumpet player by the name of Michael Rodriguez. He plays with Giovanni a lot. Okay. This guy plays the trumpet like man, and he can read anything you put in front of him, and he's got this golden sound, and he improvises. I mean, the uh, first time I heard him, I said, whoa, who's that? And he stuck out like a sore thumb. When you think of all the trumpet players, that was very interesting to me. Of all the saxophone players in the world, Stan Getz had a sound. Dexter Gordon had a sound. Joe Henderson had a sound. Um, you know, uh, the people. Um, but so there, there are some young players that are really coming up that I'm really happy that are taking the reins. And uh, um, the, the playing field is totally different now than it used to be. So, so I. People ask me, well, how was it when you came up? But I can't really, I can talk about it, but it has no relevance to what you have to deal with. Everything is different now. And you just have to kind of deal with what it is. And it was different for me than it was the people who were 20 years before me. And so uh, it's moving. But if, if you keep, keep close to the, to the history, the lineage, because I talk about being part of the lineage I think that's really, you need to be really a part of the lineage and the young people that are coming up. There are some who really want to be famous and they, they come across that way as opposed to uh, really being significant players and let someone else say that they're, they're going to be something. But some of them are really want because they, they would like to have a lot of money in their pocket, and 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 to me, they've kind of uh, when I when I've had the opportunity to maybe play with some people like that, uh, they they come across kind of not shallow. Uh, there's a young lady, Cecile McLaurin Savant, <laughs> 25 years old. She's got a voice that's out of this world. And it's amazing. She can sing a Betsy Smith, Bessie Smith song and sound like she's in the 30s. And then she can do the next song, one that she just composed. And she's the only person that I know of so far. I mean, Diane Reeves has had the realm of, of this, this beautiful, lush sound. But she's been there all by herself for a while. But this young lady is uh, very special, and she's got a voice. I mean, she, her instrument is incredible. Uh, her articulation, enunciation is unbelievable. And she's a delightful young lady. So, and you haven't probably heard of her yet, but believe me, you're going to hear about it. She's going to be huge, huge. And she's busier than ever right now. You know. So why don't we thank Mr. Rufus Reed for being here with us this afternoon? And 
We look forward to the concert. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's really fun.